Hello, welcome to the Smart Family of Cooling Products. Today, we're gonna to talk to you about our SCOD 070 AR4 air-cooled industrial chiller. Now, what makes it an industrial chiller? Well, several things. First of all, it's built from the ground up for rental. Second, there's two circuits on this unit. However, there are no tandem compressors on any of our rental chillers. So there's a single compressor on each of those two circuits. There's also a suction accumulator on both of those circuits. There is a DX shell and tube evaporator on this unit as well, so not, no brace plate. We include an inline chiller pump as well, and you can decide to use that or not use it if you've got a pump at your facility uh, or where the unit's being rented. And this unit is also UL listed and dual listed for CSA in Canadian provinces. Now we need to talk about safety. These videos are extremely helpful and informative. However, you must be trained or authorized to work on any rental equipment prior to performing any service, okay? Secondly, this unit has a main unit disconnect on it, as you see here. That protects everything downstream of the disconnect. So everything inside the unit is protected. However, it's the customer's responsibility to provide upstream disconnect means. Now, that could be a disconnect inside the generator. It could be a disconnect inside the MCC or an eyeline panel. Whatever means you use, the customer is responsible for providing upstream disconnect means. Now, lastly, we need to talk about PPE. We're gonna talk about Smart Family's minimum requirements since we're at Smart Family's facility right now. However, you should check with your company and or the job site to make sure you're using the most stringent guidelines applicable. At Smart Family, our minimum requirements are a hard hat, safety glasses, gloves approved per the job, a reflective vest or clothing, and steel-toed boots or shoes. Okay, now that we've covered safety, we need to go through the five steps for starting an SCOD 070 AR4 industrial chiller. The first step is, once the unit arrives, you need to make sure you do a walk around and inspect for damage. Because if there's any damage on the unit, you wanna make sure and report it to your local branch. That way you don't get charged for it. The second thing you need to do is ensure proper flow to the unit. Now, there's several different points back here that we can, we can look at, all right? This is your inlet coming in, all right? You'll see right here, there's a T in the line. If you are using an on-site pump, so not this one, this valve will have to be open and you will close this valve. We are using the onboard pump, so you can see we've got this one open right now and this one's closed. You see it's perpendicular to the pipe, so it's closed. There's a triple duty valve back here, which when using the onboard pump is what you can use to set your flow. You wanna make sure you set the flow for 2.4 GPM per ton. And we've already done that. We've established that we're meeting that. There's also several drain and vent points on this unit. You can see down here, there's an evaporator drain. That's where we filled the unit. So you can actually see we've still got the line hooked up, okay? And as you fill the unit, you do have to burp out the air. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. There's several points on here, several vent points where you can use to burp the air out of the system. Okay, so step three is part of ensuring proper flow 
is you have to inspect the Y strainer. There's a basket in here that does tend to clog from debris fairly easily. So it needs to be inspected and cleaned before you start any unit. And this is very important because if it is clogged, you can see this is the only way that the fluid gets to the pump and eventually to the evaporator barrel. So you got to make sure that's clean before you run the unit. Okay, so that's step three. Now let's walk up back around for step four. And let's actually stop here. Step four is ensuring proper power to the unit. Okay, so there's two different places on here where we note what power this unit requires. We've got 460 volts shown right here. We tell you what the unit RLA is and we show you what size generator is required. Okay, this, we call this our generator tag. And then on the side of the unit over here is the unit nameplate. So you can see here, this also shows the RLA, the MCA, and the max fuse size. Okay, it shows you voltage. And another important thing to look at is they do show uh, an FO number, which if you have any instances where you require uh, field parts, where you have to, uh, you know, whatever may fail in the field, you can refer to that when you call in to get replacement parts. Okay, so we finished the first four steps. The fifth step is to actually start the unit. But the one thing we want to talk about before we do that is I just wanted to point out, and we've got power killed right now, but this is our UVR phase monitor. When you first turn on this unit, there's going to be a 15 to 20 second delay that you're going to see incorrect power up here. And what this thing is doing at that point in time is checking for phase reversal, phase imbalance from leg to leg, and under and over voltage, okay? So it's checking for all that in that 15 to 20 seconds to make sure your unit is protected. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna break for a second, we're gonna put power back on, and we're gonna finish up the fifth startup step. The first thing we're going to talk about, obviously you need to turn on your main unit circuit breaker. Before we can go any further, we want to make sure that our flow and cooling switches are both in the off position. And the other thing we need to address is the crankcase heaters on the compressors. Now, having the main unit circuit breaker on gets power to the crankcase heaters, but we also have a second set of crankcase heaters on these compressors and there's a shore plug on this side, which is just a 120 volt plug. And I may or may not be able to get it open. There we go. So you can see that right there. So if you don't want to apply 460 volt power to the unit, you can hook up 120 to that prior to starting the unit. Now, we recommend up to 24 hours of power on the crankcase heaters. And the reason for that is Compressors don't like liquid, so having those crankcase heaters on there helps to boil that liquid off. The minimum you want to have your crankcase heaters hooked up for is about one to two hours. Now that's also going to depend on the ambient conditions of where your job site is. Okay, we've done that. Now we've got to get flow to the unit, right? We've already seen that we filled the circuit. However, let's talk a little bit more about that. Once you've filled it up with whatever means you've got available, a tank, a water hose, whatever, you still need to burp the rest of the air out of that system, okay? Because there is still gonna be air trapped in the high points. On some of these, some of these back here are our manual vents but we do have an automatic vent down here that you can see right here which you see that little piece right there the air will actually bleed out of there automatically okay now to help burp that air out of the system, you can turn on your process pump for just a few seconds at a time. And
and that will help bleed out the air in your system. Okay? And we've already done that, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn the pump on. Okay, now that we've verified we have flow, we have to verify we have the correct amount of flow. And there's two different ways you can do that. The first way is we actually have an onboard flow meter here. So you can literally just come down here, flip this lid open, look inside, and see where your flow is, okay? The second way is to come over this way. And we've actually got pressure gauges right here showing you the evaporator fluid inlet and the evaporator fluid outlet. So you can look at what the two gauges are reading, take the difference of that, that's your pressure drop. Once you have that, you come back here and you can look right here on this evaporator pressure drop curve. You know your pressure drop, you can figure out what your flow is. Okay, so now we're at the point where we can turn on the cooling circuits and the compressors. Now, keep in mind, there is a time delay on the compressors. We've turned that down a little bit for this video. However, typically it's one minute per compressor. So one minute for the first one to come on, and then after that, there's another minute delay before the second compressor will come on. All right? I'm gonna show you the inside where the operator panel is. Okay, so in here, you see your A350 controller. You can see what our outlet temperature is right now on the fluid. This is where you set your set point. Okay, and it's simply just a dial. Very easy, there's compressor one kicking on. And then we've got our VFD set up over here for the condenser fans and some additional switches if needed. Okay, so just going back through it, the five steps for starting up the SCOD70 AR4 chiller. The first one was doing your walk around, making sure there was no damage. The second was ensuring proper flow to the unit. The third was making sure your Y strainer was clean, the inlet strainer. The fourth was verifying proper power. And then the fifth was a startup. Thanks so much for watching and please stay safe out there.